we're um, on the same page. When we're referring to psychosomatic, we're talking about the interplay between physical and psychological components and the symptoms that um, then show up. Uh, when we talk about this, this is psychosomatic complaints, not necessarily considering um, an actual illness, but the complaints in and of itself. And when we look at somatoform, that is where we're actually looking at it in terms of a disorder, where um, we see repeated physical symptoms that have negative findings medically um, and negative or reassurances from providers that the symptoms really have no physical basis. So that's where it moves more into the illness realm versus the um, just psychosomatic based symptoms. The most um, the disorders that we talk about when we're talking about somatoform are somatization, and that's these presentation of symptoms when they just cannot find an underlying medical cause. This is more common in children than any of the others. Um, illness identity disorder, which was formerly known as the hypochondriac, um, and this is just the preoccupation with this possibility of having a very serious illness or disorder. We don't see this as often in children. This is more common um, in adults. Then the dissociative, um, or often referred to as conversion, where there's a partial or complete loss between memories of the past and current um, physical symptoms, could present in terms of paralysis of a limb, blindness, loss of sensation, um, etc. And then factitious disorder, and this is where um, symptoms are voluntarily initiated and the thought here is that there's really no other goal other than the, the um, gains from being in the sick role and in terms of this is also commonly known as Munchausen when we look at this in terms of children it's Munchausen by proxy because it's generally a parent or a caregiver who's inflicting the symptoms on a child to gain um, the sick role uh, through that means and uh, Lask and Fossen um, conceptualized a uh, continuum uh, that examines the interplay between psychological and physical symptoms. And um, the continuum looks at it uh, essentially on a scale of one to seven with predominantly psychosocial etiology on one end and predominantly organic on the other end. And it looks like this, whereby um, some conditions, for example, heart disease would be placed at position one, um, predominantly organic, versus social anxiety, which we talked about last week, which would be predominantly psychosocial because of the psychosocial influence. Not saying that the anxiety doesn't have any sort of biological or genetic base, but that it's highly influenced by things that are going around in the environment. And then things such as asthma might be right in the middle where it is influenced by the way the lungs function, but then in addition to circumstances that are happening and then stress that uh, the individual may be experiencing. So when we're talking about psychosomatic symptoms in children, the most common ones we see, and I'll, I'll talk more about abdominal pain and headaches, but the most commons that we see are uh, stomach pain, headache, these limb pains, of course, nausea and vomiting, tiredness or fatigue. And we see this most commonly um, with the disorders of anxiety, mood, and then um, also on the autism spectrum. Anywhere from five to 30% of the population of kids will report this. There are age-related differences in terms of the symptoms that children present with. Prepubertal kids will talk more about having stomach aches and uh, generally peaks around age nine. Older kids um, around 12 or older will talk about uh, having headaches, or recurrent headaches, especially related to issues of things they, they're um, avoiding or don't want to deal with. And then adolescents, you're more likely to hear things like limb pain, being extremely tired, or symptoms of dizziness and things like that. So just focusing a little more on abdominal pain, it'll occur in 10 to 20% of children. 5% will have an organic cause, but for the most part, this, their um, non-organic cause of the pain is vaguely localized or really just saying stomach pain, they can't really pinpoint what's happening. Or it's really associated with specific times, so Sunday evening and having to get ready for school in the morning, uh, feeling sick in the morning when it's time to go to school or any sort of circumstance that they're not enjoying or, or, or trying to, or could be anxiety producing for them. 
Um, it's definitely one of the most commonly presenting symptoms, um, and you'll see it more frequently in five to 12 year olds. And this is one that's equally distributed between boys and girls. Um, some studies suggest that about 30% of children continue with these symptoms into adulthood and then tend to develop migraine or recurrent headaches. So that's an association that um, perhaps might have some interest if we're uh, teaching coping skills and things to help work with uh, kids and to manage these symptoms. And when we talk about headache, this usually occurs in uh, like middle school age, so 10 to 11. This is one where we do need careful assessment to rule out any organic causes, um, but typical non-organic ones are characterized by this type feeling around the head, and it's usually associated with some sort of emotional situation, very similar to the recurrent abdominal pain, like going to school or having to uh, maybe go spend the weekend if you've got divorced parents leaving the primary home and going to the secondary, um, you know, those types of situations. Some considerations related to adolescence. We do see physical symptoms more commonly, especially in girls. Um, in a couple study, or at least in the uh, one study, and I can send you this reference, at least 10% did a list of um, common symptoms and 10% experienced 13 or more of these symptoms. And um, you know, for some kids, they do have these symptoms, they can just sort of continue and go about their daily lives, but others, these symptoms really do sort of <laughs> prevent them from going to school. We talked about school refusal last week or enjoying themselves in social situations or really any situation where these are cropping up. Um, symptoms that were most reported in this group were this, the feeling of the lump in the throat or the heart pounding. Um, headaches or chest pains, and they did find that the more the symptoms the, re the adolescents reported, there was more of a focus on and concern or preoccupation with illness or health. So it's something to consider with that population. Peer victimization also seems to be um, uh, an area where we see a lot of uh, psychosomatic complaints, and so kids who are being victimized uh, do uh, share that these feelings about two times more often than their non-victimized peers and essentially a lot of the um, Complaints that we already talked about in terms of the headache and stomach ache um, sleeping problems uh, Vomiting feeling tired or tense in Terms of assessment primarily rule out organic causes um, and collaborative assessment is best to really get um, a, a good handle on what's happening physically, but also socially, since a lot of these symptoms may be tied to problems socially, whether it's at home or at school or in those types of settings, and work on um, acknowledging the fact that yes, I, as a provider, we do believe you're, you're feeling this, uh, we don't think you're lying, those types of things to help work with it. Um, in terms of assessment, it's important to look at any predisposing factors. So is there any biological vulnerability? What's precipitating these symptoms? Was there a loss or bullying or things of that nature? What's continuing the symptoms or perpetuating it? And then what sort of factors do they have that are protective? Do they have good family support? Do they have peer support? Um, are they adaptable? And, and looking at these to capitalize on what you can do in terms of intervention and coping. And treatment, much like um, treatment for the other disorders, including anxiety, family therapy, be very helpful, um, individual therapies, and focusing on CBT, um, group therapy has been found uh, helpful in this, with these complaints. Um, and then of course, relaxation or other coping skills that they can use to help manage these physical symptoms. In terms of medication, it's generally supportive, and it's, they're, uh, tend to be focused on the other comorbidities that are happening. That's it. Awesome. Thank you, Andrea.